national budget day and the, the, the chosen theme sustainability of party as Indonesia's heritage for the world opportunities and challenges is very timely and relevant to the world today therefore I'm very confident that to this discussion with our lineup of very esteemed speakers will be very fruitful and enlightening. As the Indonesian ambassador to Australia and as a fellow Indonesian, I recognize that the party has become an essential and inseparable part of our culture and even our diplomacy. It's globally known and widely loved not only in Indonesia but throughout the world. Bati as an artwork is one of Indonesia's many cultural wealth. The government of Indonesia issued presidential decree number 33 of 2009, which stipulates National Bati Day every 2nd of October to increase public awareness for efforts to protect and develop Indonesian Bati. Furthermore, its establishment as a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO on the 2nd October 2009 reaffirms, again, reaffirms its value and importance. But its value is not only intrinsic in its spirit, but also intrinsic on its spiritual beauty, which possesses a deep philosophical meaning through its various design. For Indonesian people, batik has at least two major meanings. First, batik is a cultural heritage of Indonesian ancestors. It had been handed down from generation to generation with its design in every region being unique to the values of that particular community. Second, batik as an industrial work is the basis of life or employment for the people it forms. The demand for batik has grown over the years, not only domestically, but also internationally. It has even penetrated the high fashion industry with, for example, Dior, Louis Vuitton, incorporating batik into their designs. Thus, the industry has had to keep up with the growing demand and meet higher standard. In order to keep batik production sustainable, I believe the cultural and economic function of batik must be synchronized. It is very important to discuss the sustainability of batik as a cultural heritage as well as an industrial world. Otherwise, batik will only become a historical relic. In order to discuss possible solutions to achieve that objective, for synchronization and in commemoration of National Public Day, the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra, through the Education and Cultural Attaché, has organized this webinar. In this regard, allow me to express my appreciation to the three remarkable panelists who have agreed to speak to him. Well, at least two now. Firstly, Dr. Maria Bronska, friend of James Cook University. Thank you so much for being here today. I know very well that Dr. Maria, although she is not Indonesian, she is very fond of batik. She has been researching Javanese batik for more than 30 years. Second, we also have Dr. Yan Yan, who is also known as the Sundanese batik doctor from ITB Banu. He has conducted several researches on Sundanese batik during his doctoral studies and I'm pretty sure his presentation will further enrich our knowledge of Bati. The third, actually today we are supposed to have Ibu Lia Mihaja also from Alea Bati, but due to an unforeseen situation, at the end she will not be able to join us. But I believe that will not prevent us from discussing further Bati from the economic uh, point of view. So, we hope that this webinar will inspire our love of Indonesia and its cultural heritage, motivate, motivate us to wear and promote batik 
as part of Indonesian culture and actively promote batik as an international fashion trend, especially here in Australia. Once again, I would like to thank all the speakers for their willingness to share their knowledge, experience, and enthusiasm in promoting batik to the world. Thank you so much for every participant who have made their time to be with us today. Last but not least, I would like to thank also our newly arrived uh, education and cultural attaché, Pak Muhammad Najib and his team, and also for our friends from PPIA for their effort to prepare this webinar without which uh, this webinar would not have been uh, to be convened uh, today. Without further ado, I declare the webinar on sustainability of Batik as Indonesian heritage for the world opportunities and challenges officially open. I believe our Batik will never die because our love for Batik will never die either. God bless okay. us. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being part of the better relations between Indonesia and Australia. God bless us all. Thank you so much, Mr. Kristiarto. Um, so, as what he mentioned, from generations to generations, so it is already becoming a responsibility in a sense to be proud wearing batik for the sake of its sustainability. So, before we jump into the next sessions, um, if you don't mind, you guys can um, turn on the camera as we will um, kind of like um, take a photo session together. So, we are now finally in our main session. This webinar will be led by a moderator, which is Michelle Ignacia, who is also my fellow PR officer from BPIA. And she's currently a second year art student from Monash University, majoring in media communications and minoring in behavioral studies. So without strolling any further, to you, Michelle. Thank you, Azra, for leading that introduction. Uh, good morning to those in Indonesia and good afternoon to those in Australia. Welcome to today's event. Um, praise to God who has brought all of us here today in the Zoom. Uh, my name is Michelle, who will be your moderator for today. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the sustainability of Batik as Indonesia's heritage for the world. This webinar will be divided into two sub-themes led by two of our guest speakers who have graciously taken the time to join us today. The first bat will be taken over by Dr. Maria Ronskar friend who will be speaking about Javanese Batik and its contributions to the world. The second part will be taken over by Dr. Yan Yan Sunaria, who will be speaking about Karen Sundanese Batik, the form of urban wisdom creativity. At the start of every section, I will be further introducing each of our guest speakers and their experiences in the world of Batik. Should you have any questions, you can write on a chat message column below or a personal message me. We will have a Q&A segment after all two of our guest speakers have presented, so stay tuned for that. Now to start our discussion, we must all understand what is Japanese Batik and more its contributions to the world. I welcome Dr. Mia Ronsker friend who will be speaking about Japanese Batik's contributions to the world. She's an anthropologist and senior research fellow from James Cook University and also an author of a book titled Javanese Batik to the World or Batik Jawa Bagi Dunia. I now pass on the discussion to Dr. Maria. Hello, thank you. I have a PowerPoint presentation, so if you'd like to connect, if possible. Um, I think you are able to share your screen. Well, yes, that's right. Okay. So uh, just a moment. Yes, here it is. Can you see it now? Not yet, Miss Maria. Okay, maybe we have to wait a sec. Yes, now, now that works. We can see. Now we can see. Yes. It. <laughs> okay, sorry for all those troubles. <laughs> sorry, we are getting to, to the point now. Okay, so as I've mentioned, um, the oldest uh, batiks are actually known from other countries. They didn't survive in Indonesia. 
but uh, batik in Indonesia is definitely well established, an old tradition, at least several centuries old. And what makes batik of Java so special is actually this very simple small tool known as chanting, which is used to apply molten wax to the surface of a cloth. In other countries, in the ancient days, this kind of tool was not known. And because uh, chanting allows to draw a wide range of very diverse patterns, uh, it helped to develop very high technical standards of Javanese batik. And for this reason, batik is uh, so widely admired across uh, the world. It is uh, a very, very complex technique, although Wax resist dyeing has been known in other cultures. I wish to stress that the highest complexity this technique achieved in Indonesia, and that's what makes batik so special. Um, the knowledge and distribution of batik technique and the designs outside Indonesia um, results from two factors. In case of uh, Japan and West Africa, Batik was an outcome of colonial trade, which was conducted by the Dutch for several centuries with those countries. But in some cases, uh, the introduction of uh, batik uh, technique uh, to Europe, India and Australia resulted in the appreciation of Indonesian textiles and Indonesian culture in general. So now very briefly, I will present uh, each of those cases. First of all is uh, Japan. Well, you might be aware that um, for more than two centuries, from 1641 until 1854, the Dutch had exclusive rights to trade with Japan. And cloth was an important item of this trade. It is also important to remember that ships with goods for Japan departed uh, two ports on Java, initially Banten, and later it was Batavia or Jakarta. So in addition to some goods uh, for Japan coming from other countries, there were also Indonesian uh, goods which were traded to Japan. However, the most important group of uh, textiles which the Dutch traded to Japan were Indian textiles. They were known in uh, Indonesia as Kain Sembagi, that was the old Malay name. And in Japan, those fabrics, they received the name um, Sarasa. In Indonesia, they were usually used in ceremonies. This example here has been covered with uh, gold leaf. But in Japan, they were usually cut into much smaller pieces and they were applied to decorate various types of objects or garments. And here there are two uh, examples. Uh, um, you can see uh, those um, Indian fabrics with uh, Javanese motifs, uh, with those elongated uh, triangles, tumpal, which are used uh, in the first example as an obi, and in the second example to as a wrapping of a tea box container used in tea ceremony in Japan. So that's how those Indonesian motifs traveled to Japan via Indonesian textile, via Indian textiles. Those Indian textiles, which initially were made with the idea of trading them in Indonesia, but they were also sent to uh, Japan. Well, at the 1854s, Japan opened to the outside world, and from the end of the 19th century, there was a direct trade with Indonesia that was set up. And batik started to be traded to Japan, especially in the 20th century. Here's an example of a kimono, which was made of two types of batik clothes. They are from two different parts of Java. The top one is from the North Coast, and the lower one, the lower batik, is from Central Java, probably from Surakarta, and they were made into a Japanese uh, kimono. There were many more examples like that. Uh, there was a huge interest in Japan and huge appreciation of the Vatican. Uh, um, 
the Japanese people were very much interested in batik to such extent uh, that in the 1920s uh, there was um, a special Japanese batik company set up in Jakarta. It was known as Batik Fuji and they produced uh, exclusively for Japanese market silk batiks. Uh, um, you can see here um, a logo of this, uh, an advert of this company and some samples of uh, obi which were produced with uh, Japanese dyes and Japanese motifs, but for Japan in the 1930s. The appreciation of the uh, Japanese uh, market of uh, batik of Indonesia lasts until today. And I estimate that uh, nowadays at least a dozen of batik workshops in Indonesia makes batik for Japan. One of such companies is run by, in Pekalongan by Mr. Roni Oktabirawa. Uh, here are some uh, batik uh, tourist fabrics, which are distant for kimono and uh, obis. Uh, and as you can see, they are decorated with uh, Indonesian motifs or sometimes with Japanese motifs. Uh, um, the fabric on the right is actually uh, inspired by shibori, Japanese shibori technique, but it's made in the technique of batik. So this market in Japan, I would say for Japanese batik is quite consistent. It's not huge perhaps, but the interest of uh, Japanese people in batik of Java well extends for more than 300 years, perhaps uh, even longer. So this is quite special, quite significant. And as I said, it's been initially related to the trade in those Indian textiles with uh, uh, motifs which were destined for Indonesian market. And why is it so? Why uh, Japan is uh, so much interested and appreciates uh, Batik of Java? Well, in principle, in the culture of Japan, high quality craft is highly appreciated. And this is what Javanese batik can offer to people in Japan. And uh, therefore, the Japanese clients are very keen to wear, to use uh, batik of uh, Indonesia. Now let's move to quite different area, to Africa. And here, in case of Africa, it was also trade, but the detailed factors were quite different which were responsible for the transfer of Batik iconography to West Africa. And to understand uh, the origins of this process, we have to move to Java. We have to move in time to Java, to the beginning of the 19th century, when uh, Thomas Stanford Raffles was the governor of Java. It was his idea to produce in Europe copies of Javanese Batik. They were printed in the UK and he hoped to sell them with high profit on Java. Here we can see the advert that he placed in one of the newspapers in Jakarta in 1814. Well, I have to say that initially uh, this project was not very successful because the dyes, uh, the, the copies of batiks produced in Europe were of poor quality and Indonesian people um, demanded much higher quality and the dyes were running and so on. But after a while, um, European uh, colorists, uh, they learn how to make uh, good quality uh, copies of batiks. And most of the 19th century, that fabrics have been traded to Indonesia. They were usually worn uh, by lower strata of Javanese society, or they were worn outside uh, Java. They were quite popular in Bali, Sulawesi, Sumatra. This is uh, quite an interesting example of batik imitations, the earliest that I found during my research. Um, they were produced in 1829, and as you know, at that time, the Dutch traded with Japan and they were selling diverse groups of textiles. So they were also trying to introduce those imitations of batiks made in Europe, at that time, Britain stopped making them. It was the Netherlands, Holland, who started pro production of those fabrics, and the Dutch uh, tried to sell those batik, copies of batiks to Japan, and that's why those samples, they survived in the National Museum in Tokyo. However, um, 
In the end of the 19th century, the export of the Uzbatic imitations um, to Indonesia started to diminish. So the producers, the Dutch producers, started to seek new markets and found that those fabrics sold quite well in West Africa. Initially, those were fabrics which were very similar to Javanese batik which were introduced to Africa. You can here see the original batik. This is the higher one and the lower one, this is an early print for Africa. They are very, very similar. But with time, those um, a special style of those um, Javanese motif the textile for West Africa started to develop. A new element had been introduced, much brighter colors, uh, um, designs became bolder. And here, once again, you can see on the left the original um, headscarf from Java. And uh, on the right, this is uh, a printed fabric from Mali, which is strongly inspired by such fabric. This is another example. Here we have a classic Javanese motif, uh, Parang Rusak, which has been translated uh, for Nigeria into rows of fans with wavy lines. And this fabric is uh, very popular in West Africa nowadays. So prints with Indonesian motifs are very popular in Africa even today, but many African people are actually not aware that those elaborate uh, designs, that they have roots in Indonesian culture. Simply there is no direct collaboration between Indonesian and African designers. And I think that this is something that there is a huge potential to develop in the future because those uh, designs, those motifs are still very much popular in Africa. But nowadays, the majority of those textiles, they are printed in China. So those are fabrics with Japanese-inspired uh, uh, motifs printed in China, sent to Africa. They are undercutting the local production in Africa and in Europe nowadays, there is only one factory, it is Flisco in the Netherlands, that is still producing those fabrics. Uh, so definitely there is uh, a potential for Indonesia to step in here. And, uh, yeah, okay? Open? Yeah. okay, I'll come by this weekend, right? Okay. See you, take care. And finally, when talking about Batik, we have to mention Nelson Mandela, who is probably the most prominent ambassador of Javanese Batik. Um, Mandela visited uh, Indonesia three times, and during one of the visits, he, as a gift, he received um, several Batik shirts, which were made by um, Ivan Tirta. And he liked them so much that in the following years, he started to send orders directly to Ivan Tirta, ordering more and more of such shirts, and he, he would wear them in the most important moments of his life. This is very interesting. And this is also quite interesting that, as you can see, all of those shirts, they've been decorated with classic Javanese motifs. There is no change. I'm sure that if Mandela asked uh, um, Ivan Tirta to personalize those shirts, to introduce African designs, elephants, uh, giraffes, whatever you wanted, or totem mask, uh, Ivan would have done it. But no, Nelson Mandela simply liked classic Javanese batik, and this is what he always promoted. And once again, this is also, I think, a great potential, great scope for Indonesian designers to try to follow up that try to um, uh, investigate this, this potential in, in your work. Now let's move to Europe. And in case uh, of uh, Europe, it was not trade, but it was interest in the technique that resulted in the introduction of batik motifs, batik colors and batik technique to European art. This event um, started to take place in the end of the 19th century and it, uh, those were Dutch artists who around 1892 
turned their attention to the technique of batik. Uh, it was the time in Europe where there was a great interest in handmade uh, objects. It was a revival of craft, and that's why batik was very suitable to produce unique, high-quality objects. And you can see here, those are examples that the Dutch really mastered the art, the craft of batik very, very highly. Uh, technically, those are um, very accomplished uh, pieces. And what else is very interesting, you may see that all of those batiks are actually brown and dark blue. And these are the colors of the central Japanese batik. The process which is known as Kainsogan, where for blue color, indigo is used, as we've seen on the film, and for brown, the dye sogan. And in batik process, we have to dye in low colors. And initially in Europe, in the end of the 19th century, there were no suitable dyes for batik in low temperature. So therefore the Dutch started to use natural dyes, similar to those which are used in Indonesia. And therefore we have this blue and brown colors of central Java, which became very popular also in the Dutch art in the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. This is exactly a sample of um, this classical batik uh, Sogan Lorodan process, which was made by one of the Dutch artists, Chris Lebo, at the beginning of the 20th century. So the Dutch uh, artists, they started very carefully batik of Indonesia, they knew it quite well, and then they applied it into this technique, into their works. This is another example of, um, of uh, one of the works of uh, Chris Lebo. Here I have to mention that those batiks which were made in the Netherlands, uh, those were not fabrics to wear as a dress the way it is in Indonesia, those were not garments. They were used rather uh, in interior decorations as a paintings, as a furniture covers, like here, this uh, screen. And uh, there is a close up here on the right of this uh, screen of a drawing of the screen, you can see how fine, how refined it is. It was done with uh, Japanese chanting. And uh, it comes even as an amazement to a uh, Japanese artist that somebody outside Indonesia was able to master this technique so to such great extent. Because if you look at those do dots, each of those dots is actually of a different shape or size. It was applied individually. So it was a very high skill. So those were the Dutch uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, who introduced the principles of central Javanese batik, kain sogan, into the Dutch art. But soon after, at the beginning of the 20th century, batik became popular all over Europe and it started to be practiced uh, virtually from Portugal to Russia in all countries in Europe. It was like a total craze for batik. Um, at the top you can see uh, a German lady in Stuttgart who makes batik. It is especially developed chanting in Europe. It was glass chanting, different from the Japanese one. And the other photo, it shows uh, batik workshops in Paris, in uh, and 1924, which was set up in a very similar way to the Javanese uh, batik workshops. So, so thousands of batik fabrics have been produced in Europe at that time. And you may ask what is happening in Europe today? Well, from the 1960s, 70s, uh, batik has been introduced to create paintings by Western artists in Europe, but also in the United States, Canada, even South America, and the results are quite astonishing. This is one of the paintings by Rosie Robinson, British artist, um, who specialize in the field of realistic batik. But you can also find artists who practice abstract effects in batik, who develop this uh, um, fabric of batik much further than it is done of Java and they combine batik with other techniques. If you are interested in other examples, uh, I would suggest that you visit uh, the um, webpage of Batik Guild organization in UK. I gave uh, here the address, so um, I have no time to present further examples, but you may find 
much more information as to what is happening um, to contemporary art batik in Europe as well as in other countries. Because also artists from India, from Indonesia, from Japan, they are also members of this organization. So batik is still well alive and there is a lot of interest in this uh, technique and I believe that uh, some members of this organization are also in the audience uh, today. Now let's look at India, because this is also quite an interesting uh, uh, case of interest in batik uh, technique. Uh, you are, I mentioned already that uh, batik or wax resin dyeing has been known in India for millenniums, for a very long time. And, um, but um, in the 19th century, with the introduction of industrial textiles from Europe and with introduction of synthetic dyes, uh, wax resist dyeing in India was rarely used. And it was the visit of Ramidranath Tagore, Indian writer, philosopher, composer, in 1927 to Java and Bali that resulted in the revival of this technique in India. Rabindranath Tagore was absolutely delighted with what he found in Indonesia, his experience of the Javanese and Balinese culture. He found many ancient Indian traditions that were still alive in Indonesia, which were already extinct in, in India. Uh, one of them, for example, were dances, uh, classical Kraton uh, dances, but he was also very much interested in shadow theater and in the technique of batik. And uh, during this uh, visit, uh, he received many gifts, which nowadays are in the museum at Shenten Ketan in uh, Bengal. And many of those gifts, uh, those were Indonesian batiks. And um, he also purchased some batiks on Java and he used them in his uh, personal residence, as well as they were used uh, as an art device at the art school at Shantiniketan, where batik technique from Java was introduced. You can see the couch of uh, um, in the residence uh, of Tagore at Shantiniketan, which has been covered with two types of Javanese batik. I, I showed a sample of one of such fabrics. And here, for example, those are, in the top photo, those are Javanese dances which were performed at Shantiniketa, at Tagore residence, uh, on the occasion of his birthday. And those are Indian girls who learned Javanese dances. Because in the 1930s, following uh, the visit of uh, Rabindranath Tagore to India, there was a very lively exchange of artists between India and uh, Indonesia. And uh, there were several dance instructors who came from Java and who taught those uh, dances in Indonesia, in, in uh, Shantiniketa. So they became very popular. And batik dress was used, I would say, in a slightly different way than uh, batik uh, is used in uh, Indonesia. But well, it doesn't matter. That was the Indian version of it. Um, I've mentioned that the Technique. Following the visit of Rabindranath Tagore to Java, the technique of batik was introduced to Shantiniketan, to Bengal. And batik is very popular in Shantiniketan until today. A number of artists practice this technique. It became a very well developed craft industry. But once again, Indian artists, they don't copy Javanese batik. They change it and adopt it to their needs. And for example, uh, in place of um, chanting, they usually use um, a very simple brush. So we can say that uh, chanting is a simple tool, but brush to apply wax is even simpler. And uh, it results in quite different decorative effects. So, those fabrics are a little bit more like, they, they, they are similar to paintings. And of course, in India, you decorate not sarongs or kain panjang, but saris, 
which are much longer, so the composition is quite different of the fabric. So this is a batik sari made recently um, on silk, and this is the outcome of this revival of batik following the visit of Rabindranath Tagore to Indonesia. And uh, batik in uh, India is not only used uh, as a special garment, but uh, it also entered uh, rituals and uh, special ceremonies. And because this is India, also animals are covered on special occasions with uh, batik fabrics, like here you can see it is uh, batik with lotus flowers, and this is during a special annual ceremony um, of plowing the fields, so which is performed in Shantini Ketan, that batik uh, covers the animal on that occasion. So this batik, the impulse which came from Indonesia, has been translated to the Indian condition and it's been well embedded there. Now let's look at the last uh, example, which is uh, Australia, batik in Australia, which was introduced only in the 1970s. At that time, in Australia, there was a lot of interest in the revival of craft and also several art centers have been uh, set up in remote places uh, in Aboriginal communities. One of such places was uh, Ernabella. Um, others were Fregon and Utopia. Batik was also popular there. And um, in Ernabella, I will look at the case of Ernabella here. This is the place which I have visited and have done some research there. Um, women uh, usually used to draw special patterns in sand when they were telling stories. So to illustrate the stories, there were drawings in sand. And in the early stage, those drawings have been transferred into a new medium of cloth decorated with wax resist. So those were those early um, batiks which were made in Ernabella Art Center. And um, the Aboriginal artists, uh, they use um, Indonesian tools usually, so the technique is quite close to the technique in Indonesia. And uh, nowadays Ernabella is uh, the only place uh, of those uh, indigenous communities that is still uh, making batiks. Uh, most prominent uh, batik artists, uh, later known as a painter, was Emily Ungware of Utopia. And she worked more than 10 years with a batik technique. And once again, um, Aboriginal um, artists did not copy batik of Java. They rather used the technique of batik as a new means to uh, present a Aboriginal worldview and spiritual relationship between man and the universe, which is the core value of the culture of those communities. So Batik became a new medium here to express those very important core values for Aboriginal people. You can here um, see an example of uh, such uh, batiks created by Emily Ungwale. It's in the National Museum in Canberra. Well, here it is important to mention that there were also several uh, collaborative projects with Indonesian and Aboriginal artists, and probably uh, the most um, well-known are collaborations with Bramatirta Sari artist of Jogjakarta. Uh, here we can see Agus Ismoya from this group who works with uh, Lina Pule uh, of um, Utopia. Uh, they created um, several collaborative batiks and this is such an example. Um, this is um, an outcome of one of such joint workshops where you can see the combination of Indonesian and Aboriginal motifs. We have here Australian goanna, but if you look more closely, we also have Wanyang figures there in the background. So this is a joint uh, outcome of the work of uh, those uh, two groups of artists uh, in Indonesia and uh, 
um, central desert uh, Aboriginal people. Um, unfortunately, those workshops have been suspended. They don't uh, continue any longer, probably uh, largely because Aboriginal artists who used to make uh, batik uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, later due to market forces, they became painters. They started to create paintings on canvas. And this is technique after all much faster, much easier, and it sells much better. So I have to blame the market for that probably. But uh, nowadays only Ernabella community makes still small quantities of uh, batik uh, fabrics. But this is so much as regards this very brief outline of uh, how Batik uh, of Indonesia became inspiration to artists, uh, designers, craftsmen in other parts of the world. Of course, there's a lot more information. And if you are interested uh, to learn more, I would like to direct you to my book on this topic, which I published in 2016 in Jakarta. Uh, the text of this book is in Bahasa Indonesia and in English, and almost all of those images which you have seen today are from this book. And here I have to stress that I'm very grateful to the Indonesian cross-cultural community, which is based in Jakarta, which uh, asked decided to sponsor the publication of this book in Jakarta. Thank you very much, so much from me. Oh, thank you, Dr. Maria. Those are really insightful. And I find it really interesting, especially about the intercultural fusion of Japanese kimono, Indonesian batik, and how batik is presented in Paris as well, or Europe in such an early time. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing and reminding us on how impactful this uh, heritage is. Uh, now, before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to remind the audience to please mute your microphones during the presentation to help our speakers be able to present well. Um, and for the IT team, uh, if you could please uh, put uh, the YouTube Batik link in the chat room so that maybe our audience want to watch it again later on. Now, I would like to introduce our second guest speaker who will be speaking about the current Sundanese Batik. So it's a different um, type of Batik. Uh, Dr. Yanyan Sunaria is the head of the Postgraduate Study Program of Fine Arts and Design in Institute Technology Bandung, or ITB. So I now pass on the discussion to him. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> first of all, I would like to thank to Your Highness Ambassador of Australia, Bapak Kristiarto Legowo, and especially to Bapak Muhammad Najib, as education and cultural attitude and team. Uh, also to Dr. Maria Ronska friend, yes, as a speaker and participants, students, batik lovers, and PPIA. Yeah. So uh, I would like to share my uh, presentation. Okay, my presentation based on uh, my dissertation and my research, uh, it's current Sundanese batik, uh, the form of urban wisdom creativity. Yeah. I declare at uh, 2019 that batik composes the richness of knowledge, the richness of beauty and national identity in order to respect humans and their cultural achievements. So my uh, declare is uh, related to Professor Widaldo at 2007. Batiks are not only used objects that are aesthetic, but they have a spiritual dimension and a translingual dimension, which shows the very high level of Indonesian culture. The term of Sunda, Priangan, and West Java, the area which is at present known as West Java province, is in fact the Pasundan land or Priangan, meaning the land of the meaning the land of or country of Sunda, while the West Java is an administrative term in daily application. Here is a Priangan area. This Priangan area. Yeah. This is Bandung City, Sumedang, Garut. Tasikmalaya, Ciamis, 
is the center of uh, Priangan uh, Batik old Priangan Batik uh, Sunda Sundanese Batik Sundanese society a group of an ethnic of Indonesia who most of residents live in the place of West Java province which is called the Sundaland lives in a place which is often called as Parahyangan or Priangan, place prosperity of area, a peacefulness with tolerant citizen, democratic in nature, polite and welcoming people. Often described as a dynamic society and fast to adapt with changes. Sundanese Batik In relation to Batik artifact, there is a significant statement in the script of Siksa Kandaeng Karasian of the first half of 16th century that has clearly declared that at the time when the script was written, the Sundanese people had been familiar with a number of fabrics, something or sarong, and batik as well. Early Sundanese writing are in the form of ancient Sundanese script as well as script from stones written in West Java for the 11th to 18th century in the era of Sundanese Kingdom and Gallo Kingdom. The manuscripts are in four of Lontan, Nipa, Saeh, Daulang, and paper that can fully describe and relate the connection between aesthetical aspects as well as its application in forms of, among others, ayak. Ayak in Bahasa Sunda, it means batik. Pangeyuk, Pangeyuk is Bahasa Sunda. It means batik expert. Also, most of batik experts have acknowledged that Sundanese artifacts, especially batik, were influenced by Japanese culture. And in addition to that, there were common people that batik is in West Java or Sunda was rooted in Japanese culture. But then batik in West Java has special characteristics. The Sundanese values in the Sundanese batik represented in ornaments can be defined as Sundanese identity. Also, the development of Sundanese batik spread widely to various meaning, dimensions, goals, and the influence of modern culture can be classified into the aesthetic domain. Uh, this is a theme of a model of analysis of the form and content of culture in Sundanese batik. Uh, we can look. We can look uh, uh, three. Yeah, uh, three pointers. Uh, the uh, up is uh, idea, and uh, bottom is artifact and activity. There are the principle of Sundanese adaptive ability. First, terbuka, muka, or open. Adaptive, merenahkan. Positive, hadehate. And creative, binangkit. Yeah. Color in Sundanese artifacts. We have much uh, term or uh, words and uh, color in Sundanese artifacts. Let me say uh, one by one, uh, like this. Berem ochoy is rosy red. Berem kolot is dark red. Gandaria like violet. Hejo ngagedot, true green. Hideng caketrek, true black. Kayas, rose red. Koneng umyang, rice yellow. <laughs> I think uh, maybe the participant uh, adds a little bit uh, strange <laughs> to, to my <laughs> pronunciation <laughs> because this is Sundanese, not Javanese. Javanese is a very uh, famous, but Sundanese I will uh, uh, present right now. Okay, color in Sundanese expressions. Let me uh, say, beranang, sparkling. Malok muk, blackish dirty. Mencang, bright. Ngebrak, full moonlight. <laughs> I think it's interesting for you, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. Form in Sundanese expression. Badang, big. Bemle, stuck. Cuat, 
crotch, asagi, rectangle, rangkobang, big leg. I think it's uh, very strange for uh, Dr. Maria. <laughs> okay. Yo, <clears throat> composition in Sundanese expression. Gari mm. hal, rough. Hara, front. Clear, color. It's uh, seem like a uh, uh, Dutch, yeah? Clear, Dutch. Mm-hmm. Uh, mener-mener, arrange. Papalimpang, deviate. Okay. Sundanese traditional proverb. Jika racak pinggang batu, laun-laun jadi legok. Sundanese people are diligent in doing work until the results are optimum. Elmu tuntut dunia siar. Sundanese people are intelligent in learning science and knowledge. Lamun keyang tang tu pareng. Sundanese people are diligent in achieving goals. Thank you to hear me. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. There is uh, batik ciamisan. We call uh, uh, there is batik ciamis. We call ciamisan. Uh, gaya, yeah. Uh, ciamis style. Batik ciamis is believed to have been strongly influenced by batik Banyumas, later called batik sarian. This batik generally uses specific geometrical patterns of lereng, liris, parang, and brown-black nuances. Batik serian, which used to be in direction of brown-black leather, became lustrous with additional bright colors such as red, orange, yellow, and a little bit of green and blue. Batik Chiamis is influenced by batik tasik and batik garut. And it's less refined with regards to the quality of babaran, since it is made simple by applying to colors and uses only a few isem isem as ornamental shapes that show details of ornamental object. Here the example of uh, batik ciamisan. Batik ciamisan. Batik Ciamisan. Ornamen Karaton Galuh Pakuan and Arereng Surutu. Oke, okay. Batik Garut or Garutan, yeah. Garut style. Generally, this variant of batik is ornamented naturally, showing flora and fauna from the surroundings. The main ornaments are mostly Arereng Arley, Erut, Lereng Arben, Strawberry, Cupat Manggu, Mangustin, Kurung Hayam, Chicken Cake, Tiwu, broken sugar cane, and batu, stone. Batik Garut can be classified into two groups based on the basic difference of their ornamentation, geometrical and non-geometrical. Geometrical patterns are contained in the following ornaments, lereng calu, lereng ari, lereng kaktus, lereng surutu, lereng boklam, batik kumeli, tiwu, sidumokti, kembang, Sido Mukti Payung, Lereng Arben, and Lereng Arei Kacang. Non-geometrical patterns are contained in the following ornament, semen, pinggiran, lunglungan, and peksi. Here's the uh, picture of uh, Batik Garut. It's Batik Garut. Lereng Arei Kacang and Kumeli. This is uh, Batik Garut in details. Now Batik Tasik or Tasikan, <clears throat> Tasik style. Batik Tasik has a special background color with a blackish hue that is produced by the decay of tarum indigo vera leaves. Other characteristic are classical abstract and realistic ornaments as part of the non-geometrical patterns which animals, flora, and tumpa Stylization is applied to various parts of single objects with the addition of imaginary nuances. Batik Tasik is characterized by simple isen-isen in the form of cecak and sawut application to bright colors such as red, violet, yellow, and green with an ornamental style that is similar to the buketan of Tasik embroidery in European style and various colors. Here the describe. Ornament Renfield, pagi sore rereng putri. 
Besar daun sampai cikur dan kaum peteri. Basik tasik awi ngarambat. The mapping and inventory of batik Sunda. The production of traditional batik in the West Java Island, especially some areas that belong to West Java Region Administration, can be so tracked and mapped. That some important findings are as follow. The following development indicates that island West Java batik have used mostly the non-geometrical ornaments by exposing flora and fauna on batik gar, as well as application of abstract realistic shape in forms of winged animals and flora on batik tasik. This indicates that in accordance with the development, the producer of iron inland batik have attempt adjustment on the motif application that has become a speciality and tradition to the existing batik ornaments. This is a sim. Batik Tasik, Batik Garut, Batik Ciamis. We, we could look uh, geometrical, non-geometrical, elastic, and abstract. Current Sundanese Batik. This is Kumli, yeah? uh, motifs. This is Rereng Adumanis. We have uh, research to digitalize of motif, every motif in uh, Sundanese Batik. Sapu Jagat. Batik Tasik Lurik from motif Palung Garuda. Batik Ciamis Daun, Bunga and Suluran. Batik Merak Ngibing and Rereng. Batik kupu-kupu, butterfly, cupat manggu, membilik. Batik garut, daun sampe. Batik mojang priangan, kupu-kupu, butterfly. Motif batik modern. This is also digitalized of motifs. This is merak ngibing. Butterfly, we share many uh, pictures. So this is a, a product to uh, export to Russia. Russia. This is a Harajutik, Harajuku uh, pake batik. Yeah. We 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 uh, the, the the artist batik uh, name uh, naming is Harajutik. This is uh, at a Japan uh, exhibition. This poling. This is tasik, batik tasik. Lamat lancah ornamen from batik komar, spider. Export to uh, New York. His batik komar, his komar, uh, the owner and designer. This is a postgraduate study, Kawu Modulor Ornament for Urban Application Design Participatory. Research Merak. This is preferential studies on design object. And conclusion. The Sundanese values in Sundanese batik represented in ornament, themes, patterns, naming, coloring can be defined as Sundanese identity. The development of Sundanese batik spread widely to various meaning dimensions, goals, and the influence of modern culture can be classified into the aesthetic domains. Okay, thank you. Hatur Nuhun.
you so much, Dr. Yan Yan, for sharing us the different types of batik, like batik garut, batik tasik lurik, batik siamis, and even digitalized batik. Um, so, and I even learned a couple of Sundanese um, words as well. So thank you for sharing your knowledge to us and signifying how batik is truly a world heritage. Um, so now we're going to be having our uh, Q&A segment. Um, if you have any questions for our fellow speakers, you can raise up your hand and unmute. Or if you want a personal message, you can also do that. Um, yeah, we can type them down in the message chat below and we'll discuss them together. So maybe to start this Q&A segment for our fellow speakers, um, I would like to ask a question. Um, as a fellow student myself, um, how can we help sustain this heritage of ours? Um, maybe I would like to hear the opinions from um, both uh, Dr. Maria and Dr. Uh, Yanyan, maybe starting with Dr. Maria. Thank you. Well, um, as regards uh, how to sustain batik, this is a very, very complex question um, because uh, it refers to many aspects. But uh, one thing which strikes me most is in Indonesia is the fact that the young generation of Indonesians quite frequently they have very little understanding of batik of knowledge of batik and uh, they of course they associate particular type of motifs uh, with batik but they are not able to distinguish what whether particular fabric has been handmade or printed in a factory being a result of a mass production and that's what worries me i would like to see a more understanding better knowledge of batik among younger generation of Indonesians, because they are those who will appreciate those fabrics. And of course, Indonesia can export fabrics, batik to, to other parts of the world, but most important is the knowledge and understanding of batik in this country, because it will help to grow and survive this tradition. And nowadays, as you know, there is a huge mass production of uh, batik fabrics, by silk screen printing and quite often they are similar to handmade batik so you have to pay quite a bit of attention to distinguish uh, handmade batik from those which are made by other media but uh, i would say that this is an important uh, point indonesians are very proud of batik rightly so but i would say that in terms of knowledge among the younger generation well there is a need to improve education and understanding Um, how about you, Dr. Yan Yan? Do you have any okay. opinions on that? Thank you. I have uh, many pointers to uh, sustainability of batiks. Uh, first is uh, open. We, we, we have a connection or a connectivity of global and local uh, world. So uh, if uh, we have a, a mind, open mind to uh, any, any uh, uh, consumption, consumer goods, or uh, like uh, how to commodification uh, batik, uh, I think uh, we can uh, survive. Uh, we have uh, three three uh, uh, pointers, yeah, TK. Uh, first is batik uh, has uh, knowledge and batik has innovation, but don't forget, batik has a business mind. So if if we we can uh, we could not uh, sell anything about batik, I think batik is not a longer. It's only uh, pressure fashion, not to uh, make some uh, role of uh, sustainability. But <clears throat> and uh, second, we have a creativity. Creativity is a a must for the batik makers and uh, for. Uh, 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 critic of critic uh, batik uh, because uh, uh, many many country like uh, Dr. Maria said uh, has a characteristic of batik so Indonesia uh, must be uh, have a, a characteristic of Indonesia and for us any subculture in Indonesia. So uh, batik with uh, 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 right now and beyond, I think it's a very uh, sustained. Yeah. 
and uh, third, uh, the point of uh, integrity. Yeah, I think uh, we have uh, we we could uh, separate a batik as a original and batik ansuri is printing or printed. I don't like printed batik, but I like batik tulis, batik cap, or the mix or uh, method of uh, batik cap and tulis. But printed, I, I think uh, uh, we, we we could uh, say uh, at UNESCO uh, it's not a uh, batik, yes, uh, cultural heritage in Indonesia only batik tulis or batik cap uh, with uh, hot wax. How about uh, any any batik? Okay, uh, I, I I I agree with any batik, and but uh, originally of uh, batik Indonesia uh, to to kind of uh, uh, techniques like uh, batik uh, tulis and batik cap with hot wax. Okay, so uh, collaboration is another uh, uh, the fourth of. Uh, Uh, pointer of uh, urgent uh, and uh, important, yes, because collaboration, like uh, like uh, explain of uh, Maria, uh, Doctor Maria, uh, very very uh, sustaining to uh, more many more uh, 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 batics, uh, and uh, I think this is uh, there. There are uh, my uh, pointers about uh, how to sustainable batik right now and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for those responses, fellow speakers. They were really elaborate. Um, we have another question from um, Badiza, which is a great question. Um, what do you think are the government interventions that could have been implemented in order to push batik industries to market their batikware or products to a wider consumer base, possibly international consumer base? Maybe starting from Dr. Maria first. Well, all right. Well, I have to admit that uh, as regards contemporary production of batik, it is already very well promoted overseas. And uh, two years ago, just before COVID, that was my last visit to Indonesia. But I spent some time visiting batik workshops in Pekalonga. And I have to say that I was absolutely amazed how huge and diversified was those productions and how specialized. Because uh, the producers of batik workshops there would make special type of batik for Saudi Arabia, for example, then they would be different for Germany, then they would be different for Hawaii, they would be different uh, coming to Australia, because each of those countries would have different taste, different style, and I have to say that those orders uh, were coming usually from abroad through personal contact or they were facilitated through represent representatives of those countries in Australia, like uh, uh, Japanese Indonesian uh, Institute and so on. So as regards Indonesian government, um, helping further with that. Well, I'm not sure, of course, that international, uh, international promotion of Batik is always important. We had several uh, excellent exhibitions organized in uh, Europe, for example, promoting Batik, um, but you have to do it on a regular basis. But I have to say that uh, this international production is already quite well uh, developed. Uh, what uh, would you think, uh, Doctor? Um, would it be for for you similar or different or uh, mm, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's uh, the experience of other people here what about your thoughts dr yan dr yan yan okay uh, i think the government must take a risk to uh, promote Uh, and to uh, support the uh, batik makers, yes. Mm. Not only not only formal, but uh, maybe have uh, some uh, financial financial uh, to to create any any uh, uh, creative like a <clears throat> copyright of batik. I think mm -hmm. this is a uh, very uh, crucial. Yeah, we don't have. Uh, Uh, batik uh, copyright, 
We don't have motif batik copyright. We don't have uh, many many more batik copyright. So the maybe the other uh, could be like a plagiarism to our motif. So uh, <clears throat> the government must take a risk. There's a, I think it's a must to go to uh, how to uh, sustain or international uh, market uh, ability. Thank you. Those are really great answers, speakers. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have uh, someone raising our hands, uh, say, raising their hands. So if you could please, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, uh, there are several uh, questions to me. The first one was, uh, well, the last one actually is about uh, Batik known in Stuttgart since 1920s. Well, um, was it a hobby or produced, uh, especially in Germany? It was just a hobby. Batik was very popular then among uh, German uh, women as a kind of a hobby and they used to. There were many batik handbooks in German language produced at that time, how to make batik. Of course, the inspiration came from Indonesia, but it was translated into the realities of, of Germany from the beginning of the 20th century. But it was not a commercial production. It was just hobby. That's what uh, I would like to stress. And what else? Uh, here I'll mention what else uh, customers in Europe uh, or artists in Europe like uh, at that time when making batik, it was the veining e effect which results from breaking the wax so that the dye can penetrate. It was very popular in Europe at that time because it proved that it was batik. It was synonymous with a batik technique, this veining, colorful veining. And therefore, many artists would intentionally break the wax to show that this is handmade, this is batik. So that's what was popular at that time. But um, there was another uh, question here, which came from uh, Mrs. Uh, Dani Prakosa as regards uh, um, batik in Japan, the fact that uh, Japan requires a very high quality of uh, batik there. It's true, Japanese are connoisseurs of good textiles. So what goes for that market is the uh, production of a highest uh, standard. And some of the batik producers uh, who collaborate with Japan uh, told me that actually the Japanese expect that batik will be made, it will be so exact, handmade batik, that it looks like a machine works. It has to be so exact, so clear, no irregularities, no changes, which even sometimes difficult people, uh, Indonesian people who are masters of this technique find a little bit difficult. Also the colors have to be adjusted to the taste of uh, Japanese uh, people, uh, of, uh, sorry, of Japanese people. And one of the batik producers told me, mm, when we make uh, fabrics for Japan, when we dye them, the colors are like vegetable soup, soup sayura, you know, because that's what Japan likes. It has to be gentle, greenish, bluish, not sharp colors. So I would say it is the opposite what, for example, Africa likes in uh, batik designs. So you have to know your market, you have to know your clients because each of those markets have different uh, expectations. And even if it is a batik uh, made in Indonesia, it usually sells better if it's to some extent adjusted to the expe expectation of uh, the market. Thank you, Dr. Maria, for that answer. Um, I think we have uh, someone raising their hand. Um, that Mujiono, or that, yeah. Okay, we can start. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you for, for the time for me. Sorry, my English is not so good. Uh, we, uh, my name is Mujiono. Uh, my friend called me Pak Brand. So <laughs> we have a company, Lara Sati Bate Probolinggo. Uh, we produce the motif of the batik, not the classical motif. Uh, my question to uh, Dr. Maria. Uh, Dr. Maria, 
how can you call it of my produce of the batik because uh, we produce the batik uh, with the old motif and modern motif for instance like this and then for the inset here we put a uh, green sing the old mm. motif mm. with the like this uh, like Sakura motif, yeah, the the, the Sakura, yeah. the lady of the Japan like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, how can you? And then we produce also like this. And then here selendang, selendang with the motif the merak 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 bird, so merak bird like this, uh, like this. And then this batik tulis we combine with the bordil. You know border. You yes. know border, and then we put the border here. After we make the batik tulis, and then we combine, we put in the motif by border. How can you call it? And sorry, uh, this is my batik. How can you call it, Dr. Maria? Thank you, Dr. Maria. Sorry, my English not so good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can see that this is a very innovative batik and uh, extremely complex technique uh, which you are using to produce it. And uh, who buys this market? Is it for Indonesian people or is it sold abroad to another country? Hello? Hello? Yes? Yes. yes. I would yeah. like to to know who, who, for whom is this batik? For Indonesian people or for people abroad? Is it for export? Indonesian people. Indonesian, we make uh, in Indonesia and then yeah. we just, this is not, not, uh, not order. We just, we just make the batik like this. Mm-hmm. We just make the batik like this. Uh, my batik, uh, how can you call it <laughs> like this? Because we combine Batik tulis and berdir like this. Batik berdir like this. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, I understand. It's a, it's a very novel technique. Uh, well, maybe the clients would give a name to it. I'm not sure. Sometimes this is not the producers, but those who buy, they come with a name. That's what happens quite often with those uh, fabrics, with uh, Indonesian motifs which are sold in Africa. But uh, sometimes uh, this is not the producer, but the client who decides what is the name. I remember that there was a case that once uh, um, the factory uh, which produces those fabrics, print those fabrics, produce uh, uh, a new series of fabrics with handbags, decorated with handbags. And because it's uh, the launch of this new style, with handbags um, uh, coincided with a uh, visit of Michelle Obama to Africa, then the motif was given the name Michelle Obama bag. It was given by the clients, by the market, and it became immediately a hit because everybody wanted to have Michelle Obama bag. So I just wonder, in terms of your batiks, which are very innovative, uh, very special, I've never seen such a batik before. Well, it is difficult to come with the name. Uh, yeah. Merak buketan, merak buketan. The motif yeah. merak buketan like this. Ah, uh, like this. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pak Breng, for showing us, and thank you, Dr. Mia, for your uh, response. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, for the next question, I have a question for uh, Dr. Yan Yan. Um, if you won't mind asking. Um, there's a question. Uh, if we would like to get this batik product, where can we find these product in Indonesia? Hmm. Oh, many more, many more in Bandung. Yeah, batik komat, batik tetet, uh, batik Hasan, batik Bandung. Many more. So please come to Indonesia. Please come to Bandung. Please come to my house. <laughs> 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 okay. So uh, I have a number of uh, WhatsApp uh, WhatsApp number, so uh, you can uh, uh, communicate w- with me. Uh, with okay, thank you. 
I have a question actually to Dr. Yang Yang. Okay. I would like to ask as regards batik chilebon. I'm always a little bit puzzled. Is it so would you classify as Sundanese batik or not? Uh, many, many, many uh, Mitchell, Mitchell. It's uh, different, different, yeah. a little different. Yeah, yeah little different. So, uh, uh, Chirobon uh, is not a residence of Priangan, so uh, not a Sundanese, because Chirobon mm-hmm. have many, many uh, influences from uh, Java, from uh, uh, China, yeah? uh, from yeah. uh, uh, I mean, uh, Arab, Arab, yeah? Arab, uh, Arab countries, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another Congress. So, so Chirobon is uh, very unique, yeah, very unique because uh, Chirobon is a uh, coastal uh, batik. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. so uh, not in ban- batik Sundo, no. not in categories. No. Just separate. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully, people now will know where to get batik. There's a lot of batik in Indonesia, everyone. So, come to Indonesia. Everywhere in Indonesia, you'll see batik everywhere. And it's truly. Really Cool. Um, now we have a question. Um, how to care for a batik cloth so that it lasts and the color stays bright? Maybe Dr. Maria now? Well, answer this question. yes, uh, a very important thing is uh, not to expose to direct sunlight. So if you wear it, of course, you have to expose it to the sun, but uh, in principle, it should be uh, stored in a darker place and like a darker cabinet. And also it is very important in terms of washing the clothes that you won't be using any harsh uh, detergents because I've seen many batiks which have been absolutely wrecked by careless uh, care. So. Uh, it's a very delicate cloth. It also depends what kind of dyes were used, what type of dyes, whether those were natural dyes or synthetic dyes and how they've been fixed. But it's difficult sometimes to decide without special laboratory tests. So therefore, I would suggest if we are not quite sure, just we should be very, very careful and don't wash it in a very hot water. It just... Uh, try um, also a very gentle soap and uh, maybe it's always good to to try first of all a small part a corner of a cloth and see whether the dice will stay or not because it also it's it's a different especially with uh, antique batik sometimes people wash them and because they are old they are dirty and I've seen and there is they destroy them so it's, you can't uh, uh, treat batik like uh, contemporary synthetic fabrics. Uh, um, they are quite special. How do you distinguish batik made from natural dyes or artificial dyes, maybe? Well, it is not always possible, but sometimes it is because uh, natural dyes usually give more gentle results. Uh, and there are certain colors that is very difficult to obtain with um, uh, with um, natural dyes, like harsh yellow, for example, or orange, you won't have it with uh, natural dyes on cotton. It's also different. Uh, it's much easier to dye silk than cotton with natural dyes. But um, um, we have this, uh, uh, let's say, like a classic range of natural dyes that were used in Indonesia. One of them, very special, was Mengkudu for red color but it was very labor intensive. It is not used uh, any longer, unfortunately, but it used to produce very deep red color. And I haven't seen any synthetic dyes that would be able to match the really intensive deep red color of Enkudu, as we find it on the old batiks. Okay. Hopefully that answers um, our audience's question. Um, next, we have another question. Um, are schools in Indonesia funded by government in order to teach batik to students at all levels? Maybe Dr. Yan Yan can take this one. Yes, uh, many of uh, schools and uh, university has a, a curricula and batiks, yeah? like uh, at uh, Visual Art and Design of ITB and uh, Institute Kesenian Jakarta and Isi Jogja 
uh, is it Surakarta or many many uh, curricula about uh, uh, batik uh, like a major of uh, uh, specific uh, uh, apa ya specific uh, <coughs> matter ya yeah, matter so uh, I think we we don't we don't uh, apa ya we we didn't have uh, some confusing about uh, lack of generation ya yeah? because uh, Uh, regeneration is a must in Indonesia like Baitek. Uh, we can look uh, the commemoration of uh, uh, Batik Day yeah, in Indonesia. Many, many events, many events and many, many uh, like a snowball about uh, the commemoration. So I think uh, in Indonesia, Batik uh, is, uh, is embedded to the curricula. Thank you. Thank you for that response, Dr. Yan Yan. Um, we have another question from for Dr. Yan Yan. Um, as we may know that Indonesia is very rich with batik motifs from different regions, uh, what is the best strategy for Sundanese batik to be recognized as the identity of West Java style batiks? Okay, this is a question from Dani Prakoso. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as you know by now, the Uh, conclusion of uh, Batik Sunda as uh, four principles: one uh, open, uh, second creative, third adaptive, and third of uh, fourth of positive. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> this is a connectivity era. This is a spirit of 4.0 or 5, 5.0 or 5. Point one, yeah. So uh, maybe any platform like uh, Instagram, like uh, FB yeah, or Twitter, maybe we can uh, use it, yeah. Uh, all the time, all the time, because uh, digital in the digital era, yeah, uh, we are not sleep, yeah. You 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 could uh, uh, look uh, any any uh, yeah promotes uh, at five o'clock. Uh, 1 p.m. or 1 e.m. Uh, it never sleep. So uh, this is. Uh, uh, I I think uh, we we should uh, make some any platform of uh, uh, spirit uh, digitalize uh, 4.0 or 5.1. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, I'll, we have two more questions before we end the session. Um, as explained, that batik has been known in Stuttgart since 1920. Is it for just for hobbies or a special produced in Germany? Uh, thank you. I think that uh, I have already answered to that question. That uh, it was uh, a hobby and it was not a commercial production. It was hobby which was uh, usually pursued by uh, German women at that time. So it's just for hobby at the time. And then yeah. now it becomes a world heritage, which is really, really cool. Um, yeah, we have one last question. Um, and this one is for um, Dr. Maria. Um, how to build a worldwide icon of Batik Nusantara within the midst of various variations of Batik in each region and ethnicity in Indonesia? Is it necessary to create a Batik Nusantara icon as a representation of Indonesian Batik? <laughs> It's, it's a very interesting question, but uh, I have to say probably there would be many answers to those questions uh, because, as we know, um, Batik of Indonesia has been decorated with so many different designs and patterns that it would be difficult to choose just one as this most uh, special one. This is extremely diverse form of art, um, Batik Nusantara icon. However, I don't say that we shouldn't try because uh, think about uh, Batik style which became synonymous with uh, Singapore, which is used by Singapore Airlines. It was created, right? That kind of style. I think that perhaps it would be worth uh, to do something like that for Indonesia. And here, uh, what I have to mention uh, here at the same time, what came to my mind, I travel quite a bit uh, within Indonesia and outside by Garuda. And I'm very disappointed that Garuda staff wears not proper batik, but batik print. And I think that this airline, national airline, should promote 
proper batik. I don't say it has to be batik tulis. It could be high quality batik chap, but let it yeah. be proper batik and not just batik imitation. I think we can do better here, don't can't we? Yes. And uh, so it came to my mind because uh, Singapore Airlines, they developed this kind of yeah. <laughs> garments, which will, of course, travel with Singapore Airlines across the whole world. And this is type of a batik style. Maybe it will be worth uh, trying to do something for Indonesia. Maybe it will be worth to, to create a special competition for Indonesian designers. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, but this is a very, very important question, very good one. Something that perhaps the outsiders uh, would associate visually Indonesia with those motifs, but at the same time, we have to tell people that Indonesian batik is not limited to those motifs because uh, this art is extremely rich. Thank you so much for um, those answers. Uh, and I think we'll wrap up for this Q&A segment. Um, thank you for uh, everyone who already asked the questions. And of course, uh, I would like to say a huge thank you to our guest speakers, Dr. Mia and Dr. Yan Yan, for sharing your experiences and knowledge and making the time to be here today. Uh, we hope that through these discussions, uh, all of our audience have learned something valuable about our heritage and about the sustainability of that thing. Um, I now pass this discussion on to Azra for closing. Hey, um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Yayan and Mari, Dr. Maria. So before I close the webinar, I was told that Mr. Muhammad Najib would like to state his conclusions on this webinar. So please, Mr. Najib, the time and place is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, MC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, within two hours we have learned a lot from two remarkable speaker about uh, Indonesian batik in the perspective of historic and uh, business. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for all speakers who already share their value, valuable knowledge and experience. Uh, as mentioned by Ibu Maria, Java Batik has a considerable, considerable uh, contribution to the world. Uh, even uh, Africa and Europe were affected by Japanese uh, batik. And uh, also Pak Yan Yan remind us that the batik is not only Jawa, ya Pak Yan Yan, ya. <laughs> it's not only Java, but also Sundanese and of course uh, other ethnic Indonesia has a batik tradition. Uh, thank you very much for inspiring us today. Uh, on, on behalf of the Indonesian uh, I thank you uh, very much for all participants. Uh, thank you for your good attention uh, during the seminar. Uh, we hope this seminar will improve our knowledge about uh, batik. And then the most important thing is uh, that this seminar will increase our love uh, for the batik and Indonesian culture as well. Uh, I also thank to uh, MC and uh, moderator here, and also uh, PPIA teams who has prepared everything we need to carry out uh, our seminar today. We hope uh, to see you all again in the next uh, education and cultural event. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Thank you so much, Mr. Najib. And uh, before we really close the webinar, let me state my key takeouts from this webinar. So from Dr. Maria's sessions on Japanese batik's contributions for the world, we can realize how influential batik is actually is because batik has been an inspiration in terms of design for all across countries in Europe, including Indonesia's biggest trade partner from the EU, which is the Netherlands, and also across Africa, Asia, and the USA, Canada. And not only design, but also the process. For example, in India, on the way they produce pattern from the brush that looks like chanting, uh, it also kind of influenced that. And from Dr. Yan Yan, uh, with the topic of current Sundanese batik, uh, it's very interesting to realize that batik is actually a mirror of Sundanese people with four values, uh, which includes being open, adaptive, positive, and also creative. And I've also um, realized that um, several batik from different regions 
portray different aspects. For example, batik jarutan will portray uh, more on geometrical aspects, and batik cianjur more on the agriculture. Mega Mendung is more on the bright and positive sides. So they really decombine identity and activities within the design aspect. So what I got from this whole webinar is how batik is actually inspired by our people, Indonesian people, but also inspire others to create fashion design to later become modified. So that's all I can say from um, today's webinar. And I was also asked to remind the IT team if you made to share the link uh, for the video that we played earlier, earlier on uh, before we started this webinar on the chat so that people can um, rewatch that. And before I end the sessions, I was also told to take a picture, take another picture. So if uh, you don't mind to turn on the camera, it will be very good. So I'll just wait for a moment until everybody's have um, their camera on. Perfect. Okay. So there will be four slides and I'll be taking um, four times. Let's hang on. So we don't know which slides we're on, so just get your smiles ready. In one, two, three. Okay. Um, second one, in one, two, three. Perfect. Okay, the third one. One, two, three. As for the last one, one, two, three. All right, okay. And I think that's all that I have to say. And um, uh, I would love to see you all again as um, Pat Najib has already mentioned uh, in probably further events from the educational uh, sector in the KBRI. So, um, Without really strolling around again, I would like to thank all the audiences on behalf of the Indonesian Embassy for Australia and PPIA. I'm Azra Ali officially signing out and thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much, uh, you. Bu Maria, Pak Yan Yan. <laughs> thank you so much for the speakers. <laughs> for the, for the thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much. You all. Thank you very much for inviting me. It is always such a great pleasure to talk about Bali Batik. This is fantastic heritage of Indonesia. You can be very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Bro. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. See you in Indonesia one day. <laughs>